so I'm the infrastructure lead. And the thing that I want you to understand by the end of this talk is what you can do with our infrastructure. So when we look at how people set up MD simulations, we're pretty familiar with starting by finding a PDB you like or docking a drug you like, and we can't help you there. But where we can help you is at parameterization. So you can put a drug through GAF or CGenFF, depending on your favorite MD engine. You can ignore the warnings about how you should benchmark the generated parameters and not just blindly use them. Then you can do your all, all your black magic to the PDB file, like, I don't know, adding caps, adding waters, keeping waters, setting protonation states, however you, however you feel like it should be done. Then you can put the PDB file for your MD engine's uh, preparation scheme to get the parameter files. You set your box and size and shape, you add your solvent, your salt, you run an equilibration, you realize that your drug had the wrong chirality, you reparameterize, resolvate, re-equilibrate everything, you run your simulation, you feel like things have gone surprisingly well, and that you should try this out in a different force field. Then you do everything again with your new force field, hopefully the same way, but your notes weren't that great. And you make sure to change your non-bonded cutoff because that's, what, that's the way you're supposed to use a different force field is you need to be changing your non-bonded cutoff in your simulation settings, otherwise you're doing it wrong. But then you realize your MD engine doesn't support the enhanced sampling method you wanted to use. So you try to get Plumed working and like some numbers come out and you're like 60% sure that they're good numbers. And then you just give up and redo everything with a different MD engine. So scripts and experience help, but preparation tools are permissive and failure is often detected late. Tools tend to move from chemistry world to model world as early as possible. Protein and ligand force fields use completely different tool sets and you're kind of left to figure out how to put them together at the end if you want to mix and match. Uh, the tools often need user oversight and are difficult to run in batch in an automated pipeline. The tools and force fields are often engine specific and you can't really interoperate easily. And the parameters that affect the energy are not all encapsulated in the force field. So at open force field, we thought, what if your tools remembered the intended chemistry throughout the preparation, even after the parameters were assigned, the, the chemistry could be known and, and referenced in the appropriate times. What if the same tools and force fields worked for both ligands and proteins, just they're all molecules? What if the same tools and force fields could be used for any MD engine? And you could prepare the whole system and then apply the force field and export to any engine where everything was just done in a Python interface, not jumping between tools with different styles of arguments or different file formats. And if the tools warned you when you were doing something that didn't seem to make chemical sense. And finally, what if all of the energetic parameters, everything that you need to figure out the energy of a system except for the coordinates was included in the force field file. So advances in force fields are cool, and we built a lot of infrastructure for applying them too. Uh, again, I'm the infrastructure guy. So we can take in just about any chemical format from SMILES to PDB and give you a parameterized system. You can prepare the system once and then parameterize it any number of times with any combination of force fields and, and MD engines. And I think our support for new force field technology for new functional forms is going to make this even better. So we wanna take you through what's available now and get you excited about the changes that are coming up. Here's the OpenFF workflow. Uh, system preparation happens between the chemical structure files section and the topology section. And that's where you're putting things together. That's where you're solvating. And so you can bring us, starting there, you can bring us your prepared system in any, in any format. Uh, if you have the OpenEye wrapper in particular, or if you have an OpenEye license, the list of formats that you can come with is ridiculous. Uh, and with our DKit, you can take quite a few. You can get basically all the common formats, uh, except MOL2, because that's very tricky, uh, with our DKit backend as well. But more or less anything that defines a chemical graph is in scope as a starting point for OpenFF. Um, 
And especially one thing that we've been struggling with is the loading of PDBs because PDBs, sometimes they have components or, you know, residues that meet a set template. And so we can look them up from a library like, oh, is this supposed to be a double bond? Is that supposed to have a formal charge? Uh, but oftentimes it doesn't. Oftentimes you've just got a small molecule in a PDB file. And we are now building out, we've, we've had some rudimentary functionality since very early on, but we're really building out right now the ability to load unrecognized components from PDB files. So you can create a topology, which has a complete physiochemical description of the system. That's the protein, your drug, your water and salts and cofactors, membranes, buffer chemicals, whatever, along with the starting positions and the box size. And you can save that out to a disk if you like, just as a topology with no parameters yet. And then, uh, do I have a, yeah. And then you can combine that with a force field to get an interchange. Uh, and so again, the Smirnoff force field specifies everything. Your cutoffs, you don't need to worry about setting that correctly so you're not misusing the force field. That's already specified in a Smirnoff force field. Uh, how to apply the parameters, the PME settings, whether constraints are used, it's all defined in the force field. And our force field format, I think we can safely say is more extensible than other formats. Uh, it's easier to debug problems with Smirnoff force fields like we saw this morning. Uh, without getting tangled up in atom type relationships and things like that. And then we can use interchange to get output files suitable for simulation in a number of MD engines. And so right now uh, we can export to OpenMM Gromax. OpenMM and Gromax, we're pretty confident about that. I'll, I'll show you an example soon. We have rudimentary support for amber and lamps, and we're experimenting with importing components from these systems as well. So basically taking things that were parameterized elsewhere. And if the force fields are compatible, and that's a big if, we're building out experimental uh, functionality so that these things can be combined. And so if you parameterize your system and something happens and you don't like it and you wanted to use a different force field, that's fine. The topology object itself, before it's ever met a force field, is serializable. You can save that to a disk, you can load it up later, switch out your force field. If you want to use a different engine later, you could save your interchange. Totally serializable, come back to it, uh, export to a different format, must with whatever you want in the interchange. Uh, if you want more accurate parameters for some drug series that you've never seen before, it's got some exotic chemistry that's not from any of our training sets. Previous talk, we've got bespoke fit. It slots in perfectly. Um, and if you want to do anything weird, we've got documentation, all the code's open source. So if you can't find your answer in the docs, if you're comfortable with Python, you can probably find it in the code. Uh, and we have first class support for Jupyter and in Jupyter notebooks. So this is a really easy way to record and communicate the workflow and what you did such that other people can use it and modify it. <clears throat> So I wanted to announce that uh, topologies can now be created directly from PDBs. This came out somewhat silently in a release about three weeks ago, but where it used to be a very painful process of loading all the components that you want in your system from PDB, uh, you know, one at a time, uh, here's a protein and let's go get some waters. No, now we can load a box with proteins, waters, salts, small molecules, supply that they have connect records. Um, yeah, it's it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the point was in this code block we have unique molecules equals ligand, and there's more than one unique molecule in here. There's water and ions and a protein, and we have built-in recognition for the water, ions, and protein. It's just when you come in with an exotic new species, uh, you have to know the chemical identity of that and help us load the PDB by telling us about it. So when people try to sell you Legos, have you ever gone to the Lego store? You know, maybe you've got a kid and they see a big block of red Legos, the two by fours, and they say, wow, I want to buy some Legos. Look at that. And then there's another big box of you know, the flatter pieces and other box of the two by twos. And they say, oh my gosh, I'm in love with Legos. No, that's not how Lego sells Legos. Lego, they show you the dinosaur you can make, the roller coaster you can make, 
And once you're interested in the things that other people have made, then you start asking about the blocks. And that's what we're gonna try to do this year. So the remainder of this presentation is basically just a bunch of cool stuff that you can do with the toolkit. And to prove that you can do it, we already did it. And if you go to this URL, Matt's put it in the Discord, uh, you can open up a collab for every one of the things that you're gonna see in the remainder of this talk and do it. You can try it out with your own stuff. You can install it locally. Um, it won't help too much to pull it up on your phone. It was so tempting to put up a QR code, but your phone can't run Colab, but your uh, computer can. And so uh, these are our vignettes and the, the repository, it's 2023 workshop vignettes. Again, there's a link in, our, in the Discord. And each one of these, we've given a color code. So previously we've been very paranoid about sort of product management. We don't wanna release anything that the most picky of users would complain about uh, and so we, we keep things very under wraps for a very long time. And we found that's not helpful. Like you heard Rebecca's talk yesterday, we showed some kind of wacky stuff you could do with open force field and she loved it. And now, now Jensen has been investing heavily in this. They've had a person doing this stuff for a while. And so we wanna give you a measure of confidence in each one of the things that we're gonna show. So we've got a stoplight system where green means it's production ready. You should expect this to work if your inputs are valid. And if it doesn't work, it's probably a bug that we need to fix. Yellow means it's something in the public API, but you should expect to be, you know, if you feed in a bunch of inputs, something weird's gonna happen and we'd love to get your bug report. We're gonna try to fix that. And red means that this is something that's a prototype. It's something that if you're, uh, it's part of a private API somewhere or you're gonna have to acknowledge at some point in, in uh, writing this code, that you're using a prototype or something experimental. The different packages do it in different ways, but we show you how they, how they work in the uh, notebooks. So for example, here's a vignette. Uh, we said, you know, hey, we wanna show that open force field can do something useful that people haven't really tried before. And so we've made a uh, MyCell self-assembly simulation. Uh, it's actually not very big. This isn't all of the code, but this is some code showing that we've defined DLPC. We've used Pacmol to make a box of them. And then we simulated that box. And sure enough, uh, we get same dynamics. We don't have a graph here. I'm not sure if this is precise to, to a great extent, but if you have a system like this that you wanna try out, go for it. Uh, this one's a yellow light only because the Pacmol wrapper isn't something that's in the public API yet. It's something that's kind of a, we use it internally, but uh, if you wanna go ahead and use it, feel free. But if something weird happens, uh, you know, don't be surprised. Another thing I wanted to show off that we can do is, oh yeah, and we didn't do it on that one. Another thing that I wanna show off we can do is uh, modified functional forms. So we have a repository called Smirnoff Plugins and it has a whole bunch of uh, these handlers for modified OFFXMLs, non-standard OFFXMLs. And this is what our research team uses a lot. So here's an example of an octane in 2-methylpyridine, I think. Uh, and this is part of a uh, hydration or a mixture salvation free energy or something. Josh sent me a helpful trajectory. But as you can clearly see here, this is using a double exponential non-bonded form. This isn't Leonard Jones. How incredible is that? And you can actually run this. You can, uh, you can follow over to Josh Horton's um, uh, repository here and take a look at how you could get running with an alternative functional form. And so let me say a little bit about our docs. We've, we have comprehensive docs. We've now, our documentation, we've consolidated it under the URL docs.openforcefield.org. So no longer do you need to go to every package's GitHub and scramble around for the documentation link. docs.openforcefield.org is the landing page for all of our packages. Um, and there's a search bar up here that will work to find you code from all of our packages, API references, theory documentation. Uh, if you don't know what package you're looking for, it'll search all of them. And we've heard a lot back from users. And in fact, Mark Forrester has been really helpful in getting us to understand the new user mentality, like, you know, the, the wall that you hit and like the subsequent wall that you hit as you're getting started. And so we've added a page of what we're gonna call wayfinding docs. And this is sort of like that diagram that I showed earlier, but it's vertical. 
And this shows the information flow from chemical systems down into molecules and topologies and force fields out to an interchange. And so if you're wondering, oh, what do I need to install? What component do I need to be using for this thing I want to do? You can come to this page and you can click through all of these. These go to the, the documentation pages for the different, uh, the different projects and to the specific API reference for the component that you're looking at. We've also got consolidated lists of uh, projects. We've got theory documentation uh, as well. We've got a number of example notebooks. And uh, so you can, you can go and check these out in the docs and run them. These are separate from the vignettes. These are better than the vignettes. And uh, really high quality API references. So yeah, I think Josh had a specific thing he wanted to walk through here, but I'm not gonna do that. And beyond that, we have video tutorials. Like I said, we've done these advanced workshops and we record them, we edit them, we clean them up so you don't get the ums and the weights and the, the wrong windows being cast. These are really kind of snappy. I don't think any of them are longer than an hour. And they go through just very punchily the, uh, some of the advanced workflows that we show off. But docs are always gonna be a work in progress, just like the software, just like the force fields. And we want to gain a reputation for stellar documentation. This was written before the feedback yesterday. So Josh maybe should have updated the slide. But yeah, we want to hear the bad things about the docs. It's really hard to, for us to tell if they're doing their job because you know, if we have bad docs, people ask us how to do things all the time. But if we have good docs, we don't hear anything. So please tell us the things that you're having trouble with. Please tell us if things are going well. Um, we want to make sure that this is something that people at companies who don't want to get all mixed up in scheduling and IP security can just come to our docs and passively find the solutions to what they need. And we've got a new uh, centralized examples page coming soon. So right now, probably you've had a really bad time of finding our examples. You have to go to GitHub and then click examples. And then it's just a bunch of folders and you better guess that you want the right one. Uh, instead, we're making a central examples page as well. That should make these a lot easier to find. Um, yeah, and for all of these, we'll have links to Colab. We'll have links to um, installation. We really want people to, to get stuff installed, lickety split, and start using our tools. Um, yeah, so Bespoke Fit, I don't need to go over this again. Uh, Bespoke Fit can save itself some work if you run it in a certain mode and feed in a bunch of congeneric ligands. It will recognize that the ligands are congeneric and not, not overdo things. And once you've run Bespoke Fit, this is literally what it looks like, by the way. I know people say, oh, I did this amazing thing in a talk and you don't think that you'll ever find the code or be able to run it, but here's the code. This is literally a vignette and it's just called the Bespoke Fit vignette uh, if, you're, if you go to that link from the Discord. And in a Jupyter Notebook, you just run Bespoke Fit and then you load the force field. And then this is 20 more lines of code to your protein ligand simulation. So, Bespoke Fit, the product itself, uh, in the last year, we've done a lot to improve the stability and the verbosity of, uh, you know, the bad things that happen, as William mentioned yesterday, when running Bespoke Fit, but there's still work to do on that. Uh, we can detect connectivity changes because when we do QM optimizations, they don't care what cheminformatics sets a bond is. Uh, protons can wander around, you get these awful fits, and we don't prevent them, but we do prevent you from getting a horrible force field. We have it safely crash out uh, when there's a connectivity change. We've done some routine maintenance to, to follow the, the biopolymer support in the toolkit. Um, and now there's better intermediate file preservation. So when something does go wrong, you can see, uh, though it's still not perfect, it's a complex beast and we're, we're working to make it better. Uh, as William said yesterday, sometimes force balance runs for seven hours and then you don't know what happened, but you decide to kill it or maybe it kills itself. Um, We've made a fork of force balance that we're intending to use as a dedicated bespoke fit backend. And so force balance is great as a resource tool. It's got all these bits and bobs, all these interfaces where you can plug things in and all of those slow it down when it acts as a backend for a bespoke fit. And so we're looking at just stripping off a lot of the extras from the force balance fork and making it just a very liquidy split torsion fitting tool to be a backend. Uh, oh, cool. And now over to me to talk about the rest of our infrastructure. So, like I mentioned before, 
we've made PDB loading way easier. We've had it for a year, but it was very painful. You could only load one component per PDB, and now you can load an entire solvated box. So uh, this is one of our vignettes. This is a green vignette, PDB to smiles. And it's, it's got one more block below this to show the simulation, and that is the entire Jupyter notebook. All of the OpenFF code to set up the simulation is here, and the rest of it is boilerplate OpenMM to set up the, uh, the integrator. So if you want to run a simulation, easy peasy. RD kit uh, or open force field will, can't function without RD kit and open uh, That's how we do our chemical substructure matching for parameter assignment. And as a consequence of this, so we have pretty high quality to and from RD kit methods and to and from open methods. And just to show you something that you could do with that, uh, in that in that protein ligand simulation I showed you a second ago, this was our starting ligand. And if instead, before starting the simulation, I take the ligand from the topology and I send it to our dkit and I run this this reaction on it, that's this take an aliphatic carbon hydrogen bond and turn it into a carbon fluorine bond, and then take every product that could come out from applying that reaction once, put it back in the protein and simulate it. This is what you get. So here you can see these different aliphatic hydrogens have been substituted with fluorine. Here you get two kind of at the same position because of stereochemistry. Um, and you get one over there on the methyl, but we do filtering to make sure because it's replacements around the methyl, you don't need three of those, you only need one. And then send it out to simulate. This whole thing was 70 lines of code from loading to the chemical modification to simulating. Uh, so not quite alchemical free energy, but still very fun. And so the toolkit's getting really exciting. Um, right now we're, we're aiming to do a little bit more for polymer loading. Uh, we can load unique molecules, but we can't load unique new like residues from a protein. And we want to be able to do that. And we're working on that with the shirts lab right now. But now I'm going to talk about interchange a little bit. I showed it on the diagram, but in greater detail, interchange is the thing that comes out when you combine a force field and a molecule. Uh, it contains all of the phys physics parameters for your simulation, as well as uh, positions. And I'm not sure about blocks. This may be an old figure, uh, but box vectors. And we can export that to uh, OpenMM and Gromex for sure, Amber for kind of, uh, Charm and Lance eventually. Uh, I think our Lance exporter works pretty well now. And so that's our big picture. This is this is our spider that interfaces with a lot of the other members of the molecular dynamics ecosystem. So what's inside of an interchange? We've got a vignette to answer that question. Uh, so we can make an interchange from a simple small molecule like this. Uh, here's the code to make it. And then we can say, OK, interchange, what's in you? Tell me about your bonds. Tell me about all the force field parameters that get exercised in parameterizing this molecule. And it says, well, there's three unique force field parameters, and I'm going to vectorize these out so it's sort of a linear, but here's the k's and here's the lengths. So these k's are up in the hundreds, the lengths are in angstroms. And then we can say, well, where are these unique force field parameters applied? And it can give us a number of more useful representations, but for presentations, this is a great representation. It will give us a sparse matrix. Uh, telling us where these different parameters get applied to the actual topological bonds in the system. And if we multiply these matrices, we get the uh, system parameters, which are, again, two columns, k and length. But these are, and I've numbered the rows here, so a carbon-fluorine bond has these parameters. Number four is also carbon-fluorine. It should have the same parameters. Um, and so if you were interested in doing some like ML optimization, force field interface stuff, Interchange is there for you. It's got these APIs, it's got a few others. You can just pull physics parameters out. You can pull the assignment matrices out or the uh, parameter assignment matrices out and get to work using ML tools. Here's a similar vignette. This is showing, um, we parameterized a molecule and then we're just showing the bond length because we just wanted to pick a parameter that's assigned to each bond in here. Uh, this is the smiles parameters vignette. <clears throat> Interchange can export to different MD engines. Uh, here, for example, this is a box of DMSO, ethanol, and some sort of like sugar thing. 
Uh, and we've created it using PACML. We've uh, assigned parameters. We've created an interchange. And on the left, we exported it to OpenMM. And this is a trajectory of the OpenMM simulation. On the right, we've exported to Gromax. In Gromax, I did a, an energy minimization and NPT thing, so it looks a little bit more packed. But yeah, simulations run. They don't explode. Things are looking pretty good. Uh, we had a slight bug with water, but I think I saw it got fixed this morning. Yeah. So go ahead, play around with Gromax. Um, yellow light, we haven't exhaustively tested out the Gromax exporter, but it doesn't explode so far. The energy, single point energies look good so far. Um, and if you smell anything funny when you try it, open up a bug report for us. Uh, there's early support, and this is prototype, so this is red. Uh, there's early support for creating interchanges from already existing OpenMM systems. So you can get OpenMM systems from a variety of places, like the OpenMM force fields package can make you a charm lipid or something. And you could load that into an interchange for combination with other components. Force fields are hugely detailed. Not all things are compatible. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit rough going, and there's going to be a lot of user experience uh, improvement that we need to do in this field. But here, for example, we've taken a sample six uh, host guest system, and we've loaded it into interchange uh, using the from OpenMM method. So here's call it, or interchange from OpenMM. And indeed, we've evaluated it. The numbers are maybe a little bit funny, but we got it in there, and it's to a place where we can re-export it to OpenMM. We have the data structures. It's holding on to it. We could try to export it to Chromax. But that would probably be even uglier. Uh, so this one, this one's not wiggling as an indication of, of how much we trust it. Uh, this is a red vignette. And another red vignette is the plus operator. And this is one of, everybody loved this about Permit, is you've got the plus operator. You can load arbitrary components, stick them together, and watch them wiggle in the same box. Over here, uh, we create a ligand interchange just using our standard ligand parameterization workflow. We make a protein interchange. This one's using the FF14SB force field, and then we combine them together. You don't need to do this to use this workflow, by the way. The normal way to do it is to make a single force field and apply that to a topology with both the ligand and the protein. But if you wanted to do it this way, you can. And we can use that. And here's an example of exporting it to different formats. There's a little bit of gobbledygook because of bond constraints. Everybody handles them differently. They're, they get a little bit mangled in the, in the exporting. So again, this is red. Um, but for the most part, OpenMM and Gromax are matching closely on a lot of numbers. Amber, it looks like we got something fun going on. But these are things that you can do, and we're going to be working on improving uh, the reliability of these. We're not getting parsing errors anymore. We're getting numerical errors. So that's good. Beyond interchange, uh, I believe it was Bill Swope mentioned yesterday he tried to tangle with QC Archive. It was very difficult. Um, we don't have our scientists tangle with QC Archive. We have thick rubber gloves that are called QC Submit. Uh, which reach out to QC Archive, but it's your guide as an MM practitioner in QC land. Uh, the open force fields data sets on QC Archive have additional metadata saying which chemical graph they're trying to encode along with some other things. And if you use QC Submit, uh, we use QC Submit to submit those, but you're not going to be submitting data sets. If you want to pull down our large data sets, you can put on those same gloves, pull them down, and get graph molecules with energies attached. Uh, here, for example, this is one of the torsion drives from our protein fitting project, which you'll hear about after the break. Uh, this is uh, valine, alanine valine, I believe. And this is a 2D torsion drive, so it's, it's got like a bajillion points. But in the end, you get this uh, nice energy plot, which I put in hard trees because I didn't have time to convert. Uh, Infrastructure-wise, we're also building out Alchemist scale. This is what David Dotson spoke about yesterday. Uh, this is our large-scale orchestrator for big numbers of free energy calculations. We're going to be using that routinely in force field benchmarking. It's I'm not showing you anything wiggling here, not because nothing's wiggled. Thousands of CPU hours of things have wiggled, but it's a very large data structure in a database, and it's not practical to go get wiggling out just for a talk. But this is running. Um, it's very exciting. Right now, it's sort of a tool for internal use. Our deployment docs are pretty good. We hope we have a lot of researchers at different institutions getting access to this. And I think that you could passively try spinning one up at your own institution. But if it has trouble, I wouldn't be too surprised. Uh, it's, it's kind of a complex beast just by nature of its scale. And so one of our big goals in the next year is to make uh, the user experience 
for going through the toolkit and getting to a simulation a lot easier. And so for example, this is the non-canonical amino acid uh, vignette or uh, workshop that got Rebecca on the track that brought her ultimately here nine months later. Uh, this took 40 seconds to run, just execution time, and had about 160 lines of code. You had to chop out the new amino acid and put caps on it and calculate charges. And uh, it was a whole mess to load it, too. To load it from PDB was just awful. And with topology from PDB, and I didn't use the same modified amino acid in this case, just for a technical reason. But here I've made uh, an amino acid. It's like alanine, alanine, threonine, alanine. But the, uh, wait, alanine, 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 threonine, alanine, alanine. But the threonine is really weird. I've modified the threonine. It's not just phosphothreonine to make sure that this is not anything that might be recognized from a known substructure library. It's like phosphorus, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or something. It's completely arbitrary modified amino acid. And instead of needing to do like 50 lines of loading this weird unrecognized thing from PDB. We just, uh, we've added a new argument and it's red because uh, this is private, but you can feed in now an OFF mole where some atoms are identified as leaving. And it will now recognize this as a substructure alongside all the other amino acids that can be loaded. Uh, this is not the final API. You can play around with this, have a lot of fun. Uh, but your code will eventually break when we remove this option. This is just here to show the possibilities of how easy things can be if we can load modified amino acids. So this outputs, uh, so over here, you can see this is from a PDB. It doesn't know anything about bond orders, the uh, carbonyl oxygens or single bonds. But the output of this is a full chemical graph suitable for Smirnoff parameter assignment. And so we can go ahead and run the simulation with this. Using the Nagel prototype instead of uh, the AM1 BCC like semi empirical charge assignment. This has a runtime of 25 seconds and it's down to 90 lines of code. So you can go ahead and try running this in the custom substructures and Nagel uh, vignette. So our big goal for the coming year is to uh, improve our infrastructure's usability. We have amazing things coming out for the force fields, and we want to make sure that we can get those force fields into as many hands as possible. So we want to expand interchange to have sort of vanilla importers for open AMP, Amber, and Gromax. And by vanilla, I mean, you know, don't bring, no, nope, we can't import things that are already parameterized and have polarizability. We can't do exotic things, but we can do Leonard Jones bonds, either constrained or unconstrained. Uh, sort of the vanilla stuff that's like the sage style parameters, we want to be able to import those. And we want to make this really easy for protein ligand workflows. Like I showed you, we can cut down the lines of code for a modified amino acid by about 60. And we want to keep cutting that down. We want all of these to be very snappy uh, and not require user customization. We want to have expanded polymer loading, like I said, and because we've run out of PDB codes uh, and because there's other problems with the PDB format, we want to add support for PDBX and MMSIF, and we want to make a major push to improve the quality of our documentation. And one of the big things is that we want to centralize it. Our documentation now is balkanized into all of these little packages that don't talk about each other. So if you have a problem and you go to one package's docs, you don't know that there's another package that would really squarely do what you need. Uh, we want to go ahead and make it really easy for new users to figure out what tools they should be using and uh, how, to, how to get started with them. And finally, I want to say uh, this is going to be the year of benchmarking. So you've seen so many exciting things with polarizability, with alternate smirks typing this morning, with, with all the different things. And as an organization, we're looking at this and we're saying, wow, which one of these should we put into the mainline force field first? We can't do all of them at the same time. That would be a huge mess. And so we need some way to fairly compare the accuracy uh, improvements provided by these different um, these different suggested changes to the force field. And the way that we, our standard benchmarking suite had run before was that it was carried over from the season one industry benchmarking project, which was a very tightly knit software stack that was made to work with exactly one version at a time. And the only goals for this were accuracy and deployment. We had to deploy this on pharma computers that we couldn't see, that we couldn't debug, and it needed to work on the first try. And so as a consequence, this workflow is totally inflexible. It does RMSD, DDE, and torsion fingerprint deviation. If you want anything else, then you will probably break the entire workflow silently with a scientific error 
and the numbers will come out gibberish, but it won't tell you why. There's a huge demand for benchmarking. This keeps getting reused. And so we want to modernize it. And we're making a big push this year for what we're calling generalized benchmarking. And that is where instead of being locks on all sides, there's plugins on all sides. So instead of loading uh, you know, a preset exact, you know, only QC archive data, uh, we want to have different plugins for different types of data inputs. So we can have local QC data, QC archive data, or physical property data sets, or other kinds of data defined by users. We want to have a number of analyses that can run, and again, just another set of plugins. The first generation of uh, generalized benchmarking will do the season one benchmarks along with the Sage uh, release benchmarks. So these are condensed phase property evaluations. And uh, we want to add support for alternative functional forms, because this is a big point. We have really smart people at Open Force Field suggesting changes to our force field that could make it much better. But we need to make sure that we have the benchmarking infrastructure to fairly compare them and do the exact same tests. So phase one is we're going to get this put together, the, the plugin infrastructure and uh, functionality equivalent to the season one benchmarking and the um, Sage benchmarks. Phase two is we're going to roll this out to the entire internal team. And I think this has been a long time in coming. And I think everyone's going to be really excited when we can give talks and have you know the exact same plots saying how our methods are, are improving the quality of the force field. Depending on the, scale, the state of Alchemist scale, uh, we might be integrating that. So when you have a potential force field you want to test using the benchmarking harness, it will also dispatch a number of calculations to pulling it home. Uh, and we may also do the protein observable benchmarks that you hear about uh, from Chapin in a few minutes. After that, we're going to be discussing a scope for phase three. And phase three could include more sorts of benchmarks or data sources. Or depending on the state of the stack at that time and what our boards think, uh, this could become a season two industry benchmarking, which does everything that season one did with the QM analysis, as well as condensed phase analysis, if there's interesting things about that, as well as free energy calculations using the open free energy stack. But that's something that'll be for discussion. Um, listen for this in advisory board calls if you're on our board. And I think that's the end of my talk. I'm a hair over time. So what I'll do is I'm going to release everyone for the coffee break, but feel free to approach me if you have any other questions. Thank you.